Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Halloween episode of MCTV's The Middle Seats. I'm Andrew OJ. And I'm Brittany Jelinski. The Middle Seats is your source for all things cinema here at Marist College. Our show today is divided into three segments. We'll discuss the, the week's news with the top five, then move into our feature review of Ouija, and then conclude with our rapid-fire round titled Bang Bang, where we'll list off our top ten horror movies of all time. Take a seat, everyone. It's going to be a fun ride. Brittany, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having uh, me. We have no idea where Jake is, honestly. I, I think he's missing. I'm not sure. But it is Halloween. It would not surprise me. But that kid runs everywhere. He might have just, like, yeah. tripped in the woods, and he might just be hanging out. So if he's anybody pretty... sees Jake, just do something about it, please. Yeah, maybe he'll do that thing, you like, you know, like dogs and cats do. Like, when they're hungry, they just come home. Oh, you know what happened? Um, he, he bashed Catching Fire on our last show, so I think someone got him. <gasps> I think that's the issue. That's definitely what happened. Yeah, okay. Uh, Jake, you're... you're you're in like the back end of my prayers. I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you, but we hope you're back next week. <laughs> anyway, Brittany, it's the Halloween episode yes, of the yes Middle Seas. Yes, it is. And we're wearing costumes. What costumes are we wearing, Brittany? Um, I am Wendy, if, uh, if you couldn't tell. Not that convincing, I, but I, I'm I Wendy. I really couldn't tell. That's why I was asking. <laughs> but you can tell that I'm Wendy when you see Andrew's costume, which I is have, Peter. I, I don't know. I look like a, like a pimp leprechaun, but I, <laughs> I, I'm Peter Pan. That's who I am. <laughs> oh, my God. We definitely look like the adult. <laughs> I was going to say, like. Pan and Wendy. Like, I don't know what went ship wrong. Of, just ship us off to Ireland. They should have stayed in Neverland. They just should have stayed. If this is what happened. Yeah. Captain Hook's like, even, I don't, I don't even care yeah. anymore. You guys yeah, are just pathetic. he's over it. <laughs> he's, he's so over he's it. He's like, let it go, man. Grow yeah. up. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> We want you all to be informed when you watch the show, kid or adult. So here's the top five. These are the top five news stories of the week in movies, and they are ranked in ascending order. Our number five story announces a new project from one of Hollywood's most prolific funny man, Jason Bateman. Bateman's sophomore directorial effort titled IPO Man is based on the fascinating true story of Mike Merrill, a man who subjected his life to shareholders, allowing those people who invested in him to run his life by answering yes or no questions, such as, should I get a vasectomy? Or should I invest in a Rwandan chicken farmer? No to the first, yes to the second. Bateman will direct and star from a script by Micah Fitzerman Blue and Noah Harpster. No release date is set. Um, I usually wouldn't put a casting or like a small project like this on here, but I was flipping through the news and I thought this was a really interesting premise for a movie. I don't know. Are you a fan of Jason Bateman? Yeah, I am a huge Jason Bateman fan. I think he's incredible. Um, even his roles where he's a really small role or when he does those movies that like you see the commercial and you're like, eh, that doesn't really look so good. I'll see them just because Jason Bateman's in them or because he's had some sort of part in it. Mm -hmm. And I know that he's been directing a lot lately. So did you see his first really one? Excited. Did you see Bad Words earlier this year? I did not. I, ca I caught it. It's actually a very funny, very different from his usual style. He plays a different character. Yeah. And it's because uh, he usually plays like kind of the straight man. Here he's more of an outlandish character, but it's actually a well-made movie. I would recommend anybody that wants to see it to look it up on, on Blu-ray or stuff. But I just, I, li I agree, I like him as a presence, and I, I exactly. will see things that he's in. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I have hope for this. Then, do you know anybody on, the, on this? Because I know you have friends in Hollywood. Um, I think I know people who were in this one, but I don't know if it's this one they did. I know they did a Jason Bateman movie, like, three months ago mm -hmm. in New York. So I don't know if it's the same one or if it's a different one, because... He has been, you know, really... He gets around. Yeah, he's been Jason really Bateman pushing it these around days. Hollywood. He's like Rihanna circa, like, 2010 right now. <laughs> like, just doing everything. Rihanna circa, like, 2010 to 2014. She needs to stop making albums. That's where I'm going to leave the but end of the story. But keep wearing fabulous outfits. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Our number four story continues the recent trend of big screen adaptations on the small screen. MTV already has a bona fide hit into TV adaptations with their Teen Wolf show, and they will now attempt to bring Scream to the small screen. The show was picked up for a 10-episode run, but the format will not initially feature the iconic Ghostface killer, as copyright is preventing that from happening. Director Jamie Travis helmed the pilot episode, which will air this time next year, October 2015. I'm going to say this. I am completely outraged that they would do this to my... <laughs> favorite movie. This is this is a bit of a spoiler for the rest of the show, um, later in the show, but Britney's a big fan of Scream. And yes. so am I. I think it's one of the best like satirical horror flicks that that are that's out there. It, it was is. the one that kind of started the trend of, of films that were like making fun of horror movies yes. while still being a horror movie. Yes, and the thing is that I'm so angry about is like Scream, awesome. Scream 2, like eh, uh, you tried it. Scream 3, <laughs> I understand you want a trilogy. They remade Scream, Scream 4. I didn't, like I was like, Scream 4 is garbage. The anger that I felt in my heart when I mm -hmm. saw that, I was like, I'm not, i <laughs> It went angry. straight to the heart? Oh my goodness. Straight to the heart. Straight to that icy cold <laughs> muscle. It went past there. the total eclipse of the heart and <laughs> just destroyed it. Yeah. So I'm not very happy with MTV. I think I was happier with that, like, whatever that 
show was about like <laughs> waitresses who were like feminists. Two broke girls. No. Oh no, I don't know. I don't know what you're Whatever. talking about. Whatever. That uh, like show that didn't last yeah. because quick, it was terrible. Quick point I want to make on this isn't remaking Scream kind of missing the point of Scream. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I just think that when when TV shows do this, it's never good because you can't take an iconic movie and try to redo it. It's the same thing as when they took 10 Things I Hate About You and tried to make it into an ABC, ABC Family series. Right, I remember that. I do Who actually remember that. Who approved that? I don't know. People like money a lot. Our number three story is just a brief footnote, but it's a note that's really worth getting excited about. One of the biggest hits of 2014, February's The Lego Movie, will be constructing a sequel for 2018. It's been confirmed that while the original film's directors, Phil Lord and Chris Miller, will not be back to direct, they will write the much-anticipated sequel. The duo, the duo will pen a script for an unknown director, as the original director, Chris McKay, will be directing a spinoff for Will Arnett's Lego Batman, which will be due in February of 2017. Um, bit of a spoiler for the end of my, yeah. my like, end of the year list, but right now the Lego movie is my favorite movie of the year. I've seen it three to four times, and it's just a movie that gets better and better on every rewatch because of how smart it is, how whips whip fast the animation yeah. is. It just takes a lot of style and a lot of care to make a movie like that. And just the writing is brilliant. I, did you see it? Um, I've only seen bits and pieces of it, but mm -hmm. I will say that if you can take um, a children's, what's supposed to be a children's movie, and you make it into a movie that adults can enjoy, like you've succeeded as a screenwriter. That's what the best animated movies do. Yeah. All of the best ones are, are fantastic for kids, and they're fantastic for adults as well. Mm -hmm. And these guys, specifically Phil Lord and Chris Miller, who have also done the 21 Jump Street and 22 Jump Street and stuff, they have a knack for taking what seems like a terrible idea on the surface and just injecting so much like rejuvenated life into it. And it just makes, makes me excited that people like this are working in Hollywood today. Yeah, it's nice when you see screenwriters and you think these people are smart. And they're being rewarded with it yeah. for it as well. Yeah. It's really great. Mm -hmm. Our number two story is all about the next project from versatile comedy and drama figure James Franco. There's never a lack of things to talk about in regards to Franco and his new film, whether good or bad, will be sure to add to his growing legacy. Franco will direct and star in Dramedy Zeroville, based on a 2007 novel by Steve Erickson about a lonely movie fan who moves to LA in the late 1960s. The film boasts a massive cast, including, but not limited to, Seth Rogen, Will Ferrell, Danny McBride, Craig Robinson, J Jackie Weaver, Megan Fox, and James's brother, Dave Franco. The film has begun shooting, but does not have a release date yet. Um, I've... I, I took a look at some of the pictures of how this guy, like, how Franco is preparing for this role, and he, like, shaved his head, he put a tattoo on the back of his head. I don't know if this is based on a true story, if it's just based on a novel, but it's, it seems like a really interesting project, and I just, the cast just catches my eye. Yeah, I am not going to lie. I'm, I love James Franco, not only in the way where I want to marry him, but also <laughs> in the way where I really admire him as an artist. Um, I think he's a fantastic director, and I think he's an amazing actor. Um, and he's funny too, you know, like, I mean, I don't know him, but I feel like he's very funny. Mm -hmm. He plays funny roles and he can play very dramatic roles. And um, I mean, with the shaving his head and getting a tattoo, we all saw for Palo Alto, he, uh, really, he started an, his own rumor that he was like, like trying to hook up with like a 17 year old. He is, like, he's he, weird. He's he just, he's, he's just like, this. he's this art, artistic type that, you see every once in a while, and you admire you admire because you're so talented, but you also kind of scratch your head because you're like, wow, you're, you're really taking some risks here yeah. with your own personal life. Yeah. Like, he is yeah. big with, with taking risks, but I think that him being such a risk taker is what draws people to him, you know? You know what risk I want to see him take next? What? I want to see him play Peter Pan. <gasps> I think we're onto something here. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I think that's a Dave Franco thing, though. You that's know? more of a Dave Franco thing. Maybe James Franco can be Captain Hook. Okay. Oh, I actually do see that. <laughs> <laughs> How many times have you watched John Favreau's Elf during the last few November, Decembers? Me, it's probably like 11. Since the film's release in November of 2013, Will Ferrell's Christmas comedy has become recognized as one of the modern day Christmas classics, even inspiring a Broadway musical. The story will be receiving a very unique reimagining re this holiday season as NBC will be airing a stop motion Christmas special titled Elf, Buddy's Musical. The Big Bang Theory's Jim Parson will replace Pharrell in the, in the titular role, and he's accompanied by a big cast that, re, that features Mark Hamill, Ed Asner, Fred Armisen, Jay Leno, Gilbert Gottfried, and Matt Lauer. Interesting last choice. The special will feature nine musical numbers and will air on December 16th only on NBC. I'm so 
amped. When I saw that you had a Christmas story in the script, I was like, oh my gosh, I hate people do this when it's like Halloween and they start putting out Christmas decorations, but this is the best news okay, I've ever here's heard. Here's the thing, it's Elf, it doesn't count. No, it's Elf, it's so good. Elf is so good, and I know I said this thing about trying to like recreate like, you know, old movies, but this like, the, this is this is a way you do it. You make win. it like you make it like Rudolph the Red Nosed Ranger yeah. and like those those stop motion animated classics that ever, the air anyway yeah. during the holiday and you add a new one to the legacy. Mm -hmm. Like I'm glad that we're finally getting some new holiday specials and stuff. I yeah. know to, I think Toy Story is doing one around the holidays this year too, or if not this holiday next holiday. Shrek's done it in the past. I like that they're doing this. Like yeah. they're they're adding to the mythology of Christmas. Yeah, I would rather see that than like. Santa baby or yeah, something stupid. Because here's the thing, when you come to Christmas time you hear the same songs every like thirty five minutes over and over again. Which you're always and excited for stuff. and then it, after like a week you're like, I can't take this. Exactly. Especially if you work in retail. We've had one new Christmas song in like the last fifteen years and that's Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You. But since then it's like Bing Crosby crap from the fifties. Or um the Christmas shoes song. Are we kidding? I don't know what that is and I don't, don't want to know what that it. is. It's so heartbreaking. We need to stop talking about Christmas and let's talk okay. about it before Christmas. That's right. That, Hello. Nice segue <laughs> to nothing, but literally okay. nice segue. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> <laughs> well, that will do it for the top five this week. It's time to get into our featured review of Ouija. Brittany, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> if you're thinking of seeing the new horror film Ouija, don't. Look, I'm all about awesomely bad horror movies that have defined the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, but where did we go wrong? We went from awesomely, but awesomely bad slasher flicks to ghost movies that don't have any sort of storyline or plot. Not only does Ouija tell a story that, as an audience member, you just simply don't care about, but there is maybe one scene in the entire movie that makes you jump in your seat. And that's if you haven't seen any type of advertisements on MTV. All right, let me start from the beginning. Come on, you expect me to believe that these kids are in high school? Yeah, they were in high school in 2002. Also, great job at getting rid of, the, of, getting rid of every adult in the entire cast. Where'd they all go? And why would they leave their dead daughter's best friend to watch their house that she killed herself in, okay? And why would a dad leave his kids for business when they just lost their childhood friend? Okay, um, so anyway, my personal belief in why every adult is absent in this film is because every adult somehow knows all of these rules about using a Ouija board. Like, everyone. It's like Ouija boards went out of style in 1990, but were super popular before that. And that's why none of the teenagers know what it is. And a uh, nice touch by adding Lynn Shea from Insidious as the go-to guide for everything they need to know about spirits and what they're doing and why they're haunting them. But the movie is still not scary. Sorry. I don't even remember her role in the movie. Besides that, when I saw her, I was like, oh my god, that's the woman from Insidious. And her role is supposed to be to deliver like a ton of exposition, but all I kept thinking about was why I was so hungry. So uh, I didn't pay any attention to her because I simply didn't care. Um, I will give this movie credit, though, for breaking most horror film stereotypes. Like in the 1970s through the 1990s, there was this formula for horror movies in which you could tell who was going to die and when. And obviously, if you're the good girl, you're living. Sorry, like your boyfriend's cheating on you with your best friend, but I mean, you live, right? Like your slutty friend you have, dead. The stupid irrele irrelevant friend you have, dead. Your boyfriend, dead. His tool bag of a friend, also dead. Also dead. That weird kid you became friends with so you could know more about the weird, creepy stuff going on, they'll die too. But anyways, back to Ouija. We feel that we know what's going on with the characters because they are so stereotypical and on the nose, but they don't follow this pattern. However, because the characters' death scenes are so boring, we don't even care that the movie is breaking cinematic formula. The acting in the death scenes is so unbearable that you're almost happy that the character dies just so you don't have to waste any more screen time. The deaths are all super cheesy, not believable, and pretty much act as a way for the producers of the film to show off the special effects they managed to get into a budget. That's another thing I hated about the movie. So generally in horror movies we find the plot surrounding death. Pretty morbid, but we don't really focus on the death scene on screen because the story doesn't dwell on them. No, not in Ouija. The main point of this movie is that everyone poor little Lainey is friends with is mysteriously murdered, and realistically, it's because she and her friend Debbie are obsessed with playing this Ouija board, so now not only am I scared, but I'm really sad. And if I cared about the characters in the movie, I'd feel really bad for Lainey. Lastly, Ouija makes a very intelligent movie movie decision in the beginning of the film by creating rules that one must know before they're even messing around with this Ouija board. This gives the audience a sense of control and also foreshadows troubles to come. But Ouija also makes the stupid move of breaking their own rules all of the time. 
why even any rule, why are there any rules in the first place? For example, apparently you can't play Ouija alone. Why? Like, I understand that if you play alone, a spirit is going to come play with you, and that's how the story begins. But when you play with a Ouija board, isn't that the point? Don't you want to connect with the dead? Maybe the general public should just be aware that Ouija boards aren't rated E for everyone. Also, looking through the glass of the Ouija acts as an eye to see the spirit that you're playing with. First of all, what? Second of all, that works, except Lainey sees all of them all of the time. Lastly, always say goodbye. They barely ever say goodbye. I was waiting the entire movie for someone to say goodbye. Never happened. What are we supposed to think now? Well, I hope it's not a sequel, because if that gets produced, I've lost faith in my own industry. <sighs> <laughs> Take a breath. That was yeah. great. Um, wow. <laughs> you kept saying, you, I, I kept saying, hearing you say, sorry, sorry. No, don't be sorry. The, this movie deserved <laughs> what it just, what it just oh received. Oh, my God. I... I'm still convinced that the only reason this movie was produced in general is because they were like, we really don't have any horror movies out right now. And Annabelle was released in like late September. Right, exactly. They have, they see a void and they just throw a film in there. Yeah. Doesn't matter how good or bad it is, they rush it out. They get like any actors that they can. And I'm really sick and tired of this trend because it's, it's taking my money. Yeah. Like, I, I keep having to spend money on this crap and it's like, they're not putting any effort into it. So why should I put any effort into this review and for them? Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, is they know that um, no one is going to go see this except for, you know, kids who are in high school and it's a Friday night and they have nothing to do. So they're going to go to the movies yeah. and they're going to spend like, well, realistically, they're going to want popcorn, so they're going to yeah. spend like $18. <laughs> Realistic, of course they're going to want popcorn. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah. It, just, it just makes me really mad that there was no craft in that story. Um, like, it, you know, sometimes you see a movie and you're like, this wasn't good. But like when I saw this movie and I was like, I feel as though my life has not been changed. This movie is rated PG-13, which is another point that you brought up. This, we're going to have a lot of teenagers in here, and they know by making it PG-13 and taking all the blood out of it and all the craft out of it, yeah. that they're going to make more money. So they don't, they don't even try on the scares. The scares are so telegraphed from a mile away. Like, Brittany and I were sitting in the theater, and we could, <laughs> 15 to 20 seconds before the kill happened, we said how it was going to happen and why it was going to happen. And, like, the, we timed it perfectly. Yeah. Like, if we can do that as Schmoes just sitting in the theater, someone's doing something wrong in the creative process. Exactly. And another thing that I really, really hated about it was that it, okay, so the movie is, like, an hour and 25 minutes long. Yeah, it goes by, like, bef like before you even know it. Like, yeah. we've had classes that are longer than this. Yeah, literally. Like, you said, you were like, I think it's gonna be, like, 10 minutes of credits. Like, it ended, and I was like, 15, that's it? maybe about 15, That's actually. the end of the movie? Probably yeah. because they had to put in all the people who did special effects and makeup. Yeah. Because those people, like, spot on. But everything else, terrible. Like, it was a terrible storyline. And they would try to go deeper into, like, the characters' lives. Like, they started saying, like, oh, but mom left us. And then it was like, Okay, but you Stop never it. brought it up again. You never again. went farther and than that. And there's no other adults, so why do I care that mom left you? You cannot throw in two lines of backstory and then expect it to explain everything. Yeah. Everything in your movie. These are the kind of movies that are so bad that it seems like they're a tax write-off. Exactly, and it was one of those things where it's not even awesomely bad. Like, we've talked about awesomely bad movies. So which bad are it's like, good, yeah. Yeah, so bad it's good, or they go down in, like, cult classic history, you know, like Friday the 13th, like, the Halloween movies, all those stuff, like, Really low budget, like not really good acting, but you just you're like in love with the story. This movie, when it ended, I was like, "All right, can we please eat now? Like I'm starving." <laughs> and that was all I thought about the entire movie. It was like, God. And then we had to go back to get my wallet, and we yeah. had to go back in that theater, oh. and I had to relive what we just experienced. <laughs> if, if I see a scary movie and I'm not at least a little bit nervous afterwards, you failed me. Uh huh. You failed me. Like the lady that kept walking, like walking in the bath to go to the bathroom, scared me more. She the was, air she was scared in the movie. More. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. All right, this is getting a bit ranty. I think we should get to our ratings <laughs> and our final thoughts. <laughs> All, All right. right, can we get our ratings, please? Um, so Brittany, you gave it a one point two out of ten. And that was I don't think very I, generous. I don't think I've ever seen a rating that low on anything. I don't I think I've ever given anything that low. Would have given just a point two, mm -hmm. except for the fact that I think that they. Um, I think the characters they had were good. Like, they had good characters. Like, the boyfriend that she has. Like, you expect him to be super, like, typical horror movie boyfriend where he's all like, meh, sleep with me. But he was all, like, he, like, really cared about her and he was, like, always looking out for her and stuff like that. Because he was an idiot and he's, like, 40. Like, he was in the Secret Life of the American Teenager. Why are you still riding a bike to school? <laughs> he graduated in 97. That's he, pretty yeah. much what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I gave it a three. Because I, I, usually, I generally, like, the way I rate movies and stuff, I usually don't <laughs> go below two because I figure, 
Hey, you, you actually had to put some work into that. Like the little, like you had to hit like upload at one point or See, something. I'm sure I don't the know. crew put a lot of work into it. Like they had really good, like oh, yeah, really I'm not good giving... cuts, really good camera angles, all that stuff. Awesome. I'm not giving credit. I'm not giving credit to this <laughs> director. I don't, I'm, I'm glad you didn't name drop him because I feel bad for him, whoever he is. But I didn't care to look him up. Here's a, it's just the it's just a film so lifeless and so boring and. Just so depressing, like. Yeah, that was like another thing. Like I said this, like I should not be sad. <laughs> I should not be like watch this movie. Like, oh, I feel so bad for that girl. All her friends are dying. I was, I like, I was, I was depressed in that way. But I was also depressed in the way, like, this made it to theaters. Like, I could, that I could have seen this too. next to The Witch from the Creek Five in like the bin like at this, Walmart. But yeah, this should it's in be theaters. next to Sharknado. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, I hope Ouija got paid well for that, and. I think that's all we have to say, right? <laughs> yeah, I think I think we've destroyed we've Ouija. We've destroyed enough. enough. <laughs> I feel kind of bad now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that will do it for our featured review of Ouija. After having a, after having reviewed a horror film, are you wondering what our favorite horror films are? Well, wonder no further. In this brand new third segment to the middle seats titled Bang Bang, Brittany and I will count down our collective top ten horror films of all time. These are also ranked in ascending order, and will be Brittany's top five and my top five combined. There may have been some overlap to our lists, but that will be disregarded for the sake of different movies. Having said that, let's do this. Brittany, start us off. All right, Nosferatu. I know what you're thinking. Another vampire movie, and it's silent? No way I'm watching that. Well, trust me, this movie puts any sleazy vampire series you know to shame, because realistically, an undead being that stalks the night looking for a woman isn't really Prince Charming, and no, and no movie proves that better than the first ever vampire movie, Nosferatu. And honestly, once you watch the movie, you'll understand why it is still, to this day, the movie that nightmares are made of. 2006 The Descent is an experience that mentally places you in the mindset of a mental patient in a padded cell. It's a claustrophobic, schizoid, ten terrifying adventure flick that masters the artistry of horror, i.e. the use of lighting and space, playing with audiences' expectations at every turn. Writer-director Neil Marshall has a unique product on his hands here. This is a predominantly female flick with strong, likable characters with actual depth and emotions. The writing is what put The Descent over the top from sadistically fun to downright terrifying and jaw-droppingly intense. It's a movie that will make you care about its characters and make you hate yourself for getting invested in The Walking Dead. 1932's Freaks. You probably have never heard of this movie, and that's okay. Watch it. You think American Horror Story is good. Well, this season American Horror Story wouldn't be relevant if it wasn't for Freaks. This movie set the bar high when it came to, sca when it came to scares in 1932. The film centers around a group of circus performers and what goes on when they're not performing. Because the actors in this film are actual circus performers from back in the day, before there were, you know, all those laws against freak shows, you can only imagine how real their performance is. I'm going to discuss two films in my number four spot because they are my favorite examples of the horror comedy. On one hand, we have Sam Raimi's 1987 Evil Dead 2. An immediate sequel to the original Evil Dead, Raimi's brand of, brand of black comedy makes for a brilliantly hilarious and terrifyingly psychedelic experience. Throwing an iconic performance by Bruce Campbell as Ash Williams, Evil Dead 2 plays with the audience at every turn in the same vein. In the same vein, Drew Goddard's 2012 The Cabin in the Woods is an expertly written, carefully satirical takedown of the horror genre. Joss Whedon's involvement in the scripting is apparent as the whip smart story and dialogue help drive home the point of the story, which at as horror movies all play out in a similar manner, to say any more would be spoiling the fun. Just experience both of these fine films for yourself. Pancakes. <laughs> Wes Craven's Scream is one of my all-time favorite horror movies. It is so much more than a teen slasher flick. It pretty much defines the late 1990s as well as my childhood. It tells the story of a group of friends in a small town who are being stalked by a masked killer after the death of one of their fellow students. Scream is a great movie to watch with your friends because it's entertaining, it's funny, it's scary, and it has a really great twist. Plus, it's a cult classic. If you haven't seen it, then you need to reevaluate your life and ask yourself if you really do love Halloween. 2006 Pan's Labyrinth that is unlike any supposed fairy tale you've ever seen. Guillermo del Toro's Spanish tour de force is exploitative and beautiful in the same breath. It features such unique imagery that can only come from the mind of del Toro, terrifying creatures that will become ingrained in your memory for months to come. Even more scary is the film's realism and the non-fantasy scenes. The film takes place during the fascist regime of 1940s Spain and does not shy away from showing the ugliness and brutality of mankind at dangerous times. Pan's Labyrinth is a horror film in disguise, and that's what makes it so unbelievably chilling. 
Stanley Kubrick's The Shining is famous for its famous lines like red rum and here's Johnny, as well as making twins the scariest of all siblings. The Shining gives new meaning to the word fear by incorporating almost any possible fear a human can have. Isolation, death, time, depression, the unknown. But then again, when you set the story in an old hotel in the middle of nowhere during a snowstorm and the past caretaker went crazy and murdered his whole family, you don't really set the scene well for Jack Nicholson. <laughs> But The Shining is a must-see for your Halloween festivities because I promise you will be scared. What do I really need to say about The Silence of the Lambs that hasn't already been said? The winner of Best Picture at the 1991 Oscars, Dom Jonathan Demme's thriller is stuffed with memorable characters, quotes, and set pieces that have come to influence dozens of other pieces of popular culture. The duo of Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins give all-time great performances as Clarice Starling and Hannibal Lecter, and the character of Buffalo Bill is as menacing and psychopathically deranged as any other figure on screen. Demi's direction is great, the score is great, this is really a picture deserving of all the praise that it gets. Silence of the Lambs is scary good, and it should put the movie in the Blu-ray, or else you'll get the hose again. If you've not seen Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, then I don't know if we can be friends, but you have to at least know the famous shower scene. It is critically acclaimed, but for those of you who do not know what that who don't know what that one scene, there's an entire movie besides that one scene, and the movie's amazing. It's suspenseful, it's dramatic, and no matter how many times you watch it, once you get to the ending, you're beyond freaked out. But for a movie to be able to stand the test of time with a remake, a spin-off series, as well as crazy fans who open up motels after their main character, you know Hitchcock did something right. The tagline on the poster for my favorite horror movie of all time is, reads, in space, no one can hear you scream. That is appropriately foreboding and vague, and it reflects the horrifying genius of Ridley Scott's 1979 masterpiece, Alien. Scott perfectly balances the horrors of the known and the unknown. He leaves much of the violence to the imagination, using good old-fashioned tension to heighten the stakes, but he also doesn't shy away from some grotesque imagery, as the design for the creature is scary and memorable. In space, no one can hear you scream, but when you're in your living room watching Alien, you won't be able to say the same. So... That, that was, was a mouthful. That was a good list. That was a good list, like I think. Like, snuck in two in there. I'm not even mad because I like them, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, so, anything that you want to comment on, on on my list? I know you had stuff that probably would have bled over. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, um, I had four movies down, and I wasn't too sure what my last one was going to be. And I was in between The Shining, The Descent, and Silence of the Lambs. Um, ultimately, I chose The Shining, so I was really, really, really happy that you chose The uh, Silence of the Lambs and The Descent, because Silence of the Lambs isn't even, it's one of those movies that's scary, but it's put in the drama section. Yeah, it's, it's more like of a, a real thriller movie, than a horror you know? movie, so I kind of cheated here, but. No, but, but I, I'd consider it a yeah. horror movie. It's I know, scary. I broke down my top five as like my favorite in this section of horror. Like I had my horror comedies, I had mm -hmm. my like horror fanny, fairy tale, like fantasy. I had my uh, my horror thriller and stuff like that, and then I had my overall horror and yeah. horror sci-fi as well. Yeah. So I, so I was trying to look for different like ways to break it down. And yeah, stuff. I tried to do that too, um, with doing like the funny horror movie, like the classic horror movie, right. like the indie horror movie you probably don't even know exists. The like, one I didn't, I, I didn't know freaks. I, yeah, you we, can probably we, watch the whole thing on YouTube. The two of us were talking about this earlier, and I'm actually really interested to check it out now yeah, because that sounds like really a, good. a horrifying premise. It is. It's one of those movies, though, like, through the whole thing, you're like, this really isn't scary. Like, why am I watching this movie? Ugh. And then at the end, you're like, oh my God, what's happening? It's one of those <laughs> movies. Yeah, like, where it all comes together in, like, yeah. the last moments. Okay, yeah. I, yeah I, and it's one of those movies because, um, like, a little history lesson, back in, like, the 1930s, they didn't have, like, they had those circus shows with, like, the freak side shows, and there was no laws against that. I mean, today, obviously, we know that goes completely against human rights, but back then, people were very, very exploited. So the fact that they made a movie about it at the time when it was still allowed and they had the people play basically themselves. Um, it was it was it before was, its time. Yeah. Okay. Now it's very groundbreaking to think about. And I, you know, I see American Horror Story Freak Show and I can't even watch it because I'm like, it's not even comparable. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I, yeah, I don't watch American, I don't really watch American Horror Story, I but either. I, I'm, I've heard good things, but like that's from my friends and stuff. Yeah. And they, um, I don't know. But I'm very happy you put The Descent I on your list. I was just about to say that. I think we should oh, give The Descent a little bit more that, love too. Yeah, that movie, I feel like not a lot of people know what that movie is. Uh -huh. That movie is so good. Especially if you're claustrophobic, like, you're not going to be able to, I don't think you're going to be able to handle it. It's very, yeah. very tense. Like how I said, like, The Shining incorporates, like, every fear you could have. Like, if you're scared of anything, it's probably going to be seen in The Shining. Yeah. It's the same thing with The Descent. Like, yeah. But that's not to say, like, I'm, I'm not, like, huge on claustrophobia. I'm not that scared of claustrophobia, but 
the movie still freaks me out. Like, because of just how the way it plays on your, like, plays on your, like, different senses and stuff. Like, you can't hear anything. You barely can see anything. Yeah. And it just things happen like that, and you're like, what the hell just happened? Yeah, it's like, also, it's not even just, you know, if you're scared of the dark or if you're scared of monsters that are going to attack you, if you're scared of caves or if you're scared of being killed. Um, it's also the scare of, like, losing people you love. Like, yes. that's a big theme in the movie or, like, betrayal, things like that. Yeah, the character work is brilliant in the film. It's yeah. really well written, too. It is well written. It's well written in the fact where we're not given an entire backstory on each character. I think it's, like, nine girls or something. But I we think it's, know, like, yeah, six or seven. Yeah, we know enough about them to to know... Um, it's unique stories, Yeah, too. to be able to, like, follow the storyline is what I'm trying to yeah. say. It, there's yeah, a, there's just enough there. And I think with a horror movie, that's what matters. Exactly. Yeah. I think I think we covered everything I pretty well. I think so, that, too. a good job, I think. I think if, like, if you plan on, like, watching horror movies this Halloween, like, you're, you're welcome. Set. Because yeah, like, this is, like, a You cannot complain. List. Like, <laughs> yeah. you complain, I don't know what to tell you, man. Anyways, <laughs> it's time to put the lights out on this creepy crawly episode of MCTV's The Middle Seats. If you'd like to follow the show on Facebook, look us up at facebook.com slash the middle seats. If you have a question for the show or a complaint, like you just said, for the upcoming mailbag section, send it to the middle seats show at yahoo.com. That's the middle seats show at yahoo.com. That'll do it for us from Studio A. I'm Brittany Jelinski. And I'm Andrew Oje. Keep that seat warm and clean of cobwebs, everyone. We'll be back before you can say boo. <laughs>